welcome yet to another episode of the Citizens Chat Show here on Civic Space TV, where we discuss several issues, uh, contemporary matters that are important to you, the citizen out there. Uh, today, we have several developments. Uh, firstly, uh, we shall be discussing, of course, matters regarding the Israel-Palestine war that has taken the world by storm uh, this week. We shall also be discussing matters concerning uh, the independence. Uganda at 61, reflections, uh, hopes, ambitions of a collective future of a Uganda that works, a Uganda that started in 1962. We shall be discussing that further as we go along uh, this discussion. Uh, for today, uh, to start with, I would like to introduce uh, my uh, the panelists for today, uh, starting with uh, Mr. Osheno, Joseph, who is a UPC ideologue, but also a media personality. You're most welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Sad that we're discussing war and death in, in, in the Middle East, a uh, war that has impacted on this country, but also consoled that we're discussing our independence, which is independence to nowhere. But I'm also gladly sitting on the chair where normally the permanent resistant guy Called at which would normally sit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you're most welcome uh, for the discussion. Thank yeah, you. it is indeed an unfortunate um, mm. topic of discussion. However, it's inevitable that, um, you know, imp sorry, imperative that we go along that way uh, mm. so that our citizens understand mm -hmm. what's going on. Mm. Uh, we also have, um, we are much honored to have the professor, esteemed professor, Mwembusha. Mwesa, you're most welcome. Thank you. And Mwesa. 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 Don't mind about Mdevesa. this yeah. pronunciation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 Good morning, viewers and listeners. Yes, you're most welcome. Uh, professor, of course, is a seasoned political analyst. I believe he needs no introduction. It's a big honor to have you. Uh, you. Next to me, as usual, ever green, ever present, uh, Green or red? <laughs> 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 Dr. Mirete, Sarah, Executive Director for Centre for Constitutional Governance. You're most welcome today. Thank you so much and good afternoon, viewers. Yes. Mm. Yes, I uh, would like to delve uh, straight into the topic that is hot this week. Of course, um, at the beginning of this week and late uh, towards the end of last week, we started to hear that uh, there were bombings uh, in Israel that were coming from uh, a designated a group designated as terrorists, that is the Hamas group, uh, killing reportedly hundreds of Israelites. The last time I checked, it was 700, but that number could have gone up by now. We have seen that uh, action uh, throwing the world into a bit of turmoil. Um, we, we know for a fact that the world has already been going through a serious war with the Ukraine-Russia. And this time, we see Israel again retaliating several bombings in Gaza. We have seen uh, America extending its warships towards the Middle East and pledging support to Israel. We have seen the top five countries, uh, that is Germany, US, Italy, France, and the USA, releasing a statement also in support of Israel. And yet seemingly, uh, the rest of the world... <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, seems to fall on the other side. It's a matter that is causing division, and I think uh, reach for discussion today. And I'd like to start with you, um, Mr. Osheno. What's your take um, on what's going on? Could you break it down for our, our viewers, this war? Unfortunately, perhaps we should have started with Professor, mm. because I'm going to yeah. be able to uh, <laughs> give you a, a very political response. Yeah. But... Uh, uh, be it as it may, unless I hand over to Professor, professor I might uh, give you a talk. There is, there is a general <laughs> the consensus that you, 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 you give the, the, the background. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, let me undertake this uh, hard task to summarize yeah. mm. uh, the history of the Israel-Palestinian <clears throat> question. Um, the Israel-Palestinian question is a long question. Uh, if you take it to biblical days, they were fighting uh, at that time. The, the Palestinians, I think, uh, was 
could be equated to Philistines, mm -hmm. although not exactly so. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Jews or the Israelis uh, are clearly identified. But uh, this time around, this issue mainly begins from 1947-48. And uh, each group, the Jews and the Palestinian Arabs, both of them are using religion to justify and legitimize their being in that area. Mm. And both of them are using separate history. Mm. And uh, because the, the, the Jews claim that that area was promised to them by, uh, by God, uh, the, it was promised to Abraham. Mm. Uh, but that, uh, that as it may, you find that uh, the Jews actually were removed from Palestine, not by the Arabs, but by the Romans, mm. completely dispersed, very few remained there. Maybe 2% of the Jews remained in what is now Israel. The rest were dispersed to Europe, to Russia, to America, to South Africa, to wherever they went. Mm. That was uh, in the, in the seven, eight, seven, around 750 AD. Yes. That is about 2,000 years ago. Mm. So they never owned that area for 2,000 years. Now, again, the Palestinian Arabs or the Arabs Muslims also occupied that area for another mm. 1,000 years, let's say, mm. from around 900 AD to 1947. Mm. So you can find that, you find actually that both of the, the, the two groups have a historical claim yes. to that area. Actually, for 1,000 years, each mm. one a millennium and another one a millennium. Mm. Now, can we go back to that? I don't think that should be the case. So yes. in 1947, uh, by that time, 1947, Palestine was a mandate. Was it a mandatory territory? Yes. Uh, of of UK mm. after they, they they had defeated the Ottoman Empire, which had ruled that place. See, that place has been ruled by Venezuelan people. Mm. If you go to history, they were they have ever been ruled by Egyptians. Had ever been ruled by Assyrians, Babylonians who are Iraqis. Mm. Had ever been ruled by Persians who are Iranians. I hope the population knows that Persians are Iranians. Mm. They were ruled by the by the Greeks, by the Romans, by the Byzantine Empire, by the Ottomans, mm. by the British. So many people have ruled that area. So, but uh, fast forward, we come to forty-seven. In nineteen forty-seven, there was a Zionist movement of the Jews wanting to take over that area, occupy it, and settle it. Mm. Uh, so the, the nucleus, the small group of the Jews, started attracting other Jews within the Arab world and, and Europe. Then, of course, the Second World War, which had uh, displaced many Jews in Europe, they were also attracted to come back. And favorably, they were favored by the British. Mm. So they increased, they increased, and meanwhile, the Arabs were also there, but all under the British mm. mandate. Mm. So they started fighting amongst themselves. That is the Jews and the Arab Palestinians. Yes. Uh, but the, 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 the Jews were armed by the British. Mm. Until the British could handle it no more, that crisis. And they handed back because as a mandate territory, the territory was a UN territory. Yes. So it was handed over to the UN, to, the, to, 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 uh, to, to, to Britain. Mm. So Britain handed it back in 1947-48 uh, to, 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 to the UN. Yes. And the UN decided that now since these two groups, two communities are fighting, mm. let's divide it into two. Yes. Almost equal parts. Yes. One would be a Palestinian Arab state. Another one would be a Jewish state. Mm. But the, the, the Palestinians did not accept that arrangement because literally... Mm. The Palestinians who were the majority there were removed from Israel, the Israeli portion. Mm. And others actually went into exile, others became refugees, others were headed into one part of Palestine. Yes. So that is uh, how the, the history started. So since that time, they continued fighting. There was a war in 1967. Yes. And for some reason, this war, which was between the Palestinians and other Arab states like Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and whatever, the, 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 the Israelis defeated them. Mm. And whichever area 
they conquered. They occupied it. Mm. And they have continued to occupy it and adding these uh, uh, Palestinians into three enclaves. Mm. There is one strip that is a Gaza Strip that we are talking about, which borders uh, the Mediterranean as well as Egypt, Sinai. Then there is another enclave called the West Bank, I think the largest. Yes. And then there is the Goran Heights, all now occupied by Palestinians, but without a state. Mm. And there are Jewish settlements in that mm. area. Mm. And they have been fighting over that. They have fought 2006, 2000 and whatever. They have continued mm. to fight to the control of that area. An international community had decided to form a, 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 what they call a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. I think mm. that is the Oslo agreement. Yes. But the Jews, the, 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 the Israelis refused. Mm. So the, the, the Israelis want to continue <laughs> occupying and occupying the whole area. But let me mention this, the audience also. Mm. There is also a fight over East Jerusalem. Jerusalem was also divided into two, East Jerusalem and West yes. Jerusalem. Yes. But uh, one of the, one part, East Jerusalem is supposed to be under Palestinian authority, mm. PLO. But the Jews have insisted that the whole Jerusalem should be theirs. So there is that whole issue of fighting, using sacred history, but in my opinion, in summary, I would say that the solution to the Palestinian-Israel question should not be based on theology or sacred history or sacred claims. Mm. It should be, because that cannot be justified in international law. You are a lawyer, you know. International yes. law cannot accept that. You cannot juxtapose sacred claims and history mm. over international law. Yes. So the issue should be justice now. Mm. There shouldn't be any racial injustice or ethnic injustice or mm. religious injustice. There should be justice. And the UN which created that problem together with the Western world mm. should be the ones to solve that problem to prevail upon these two communities so that there is a two-state solution that the Jews uh, stay in where they are and, and, and hand over in my opinion, they hand over the territories that they occupied and continue to settle people. Mm. So that there is justice. Back to the borders of 47? Borders of 47. Okay. Of 47, 48. Mm. But not this one which they captured. Yes. Uh, actually, let's put it this way. Actually, borders of 67. Yes. They should go back at the borders of 67. Mm. And then there is justice. Otherwise, it is not possible to hold the people mm. in a prison. There will always be a prison break, as people are saying. Mm. Whatever much, however much the Jews will control, want to settle and continue controlling the, the Arab Palestinians, it is not feasible. We need justice. Yeah. That's a summary. Otherwise, it is a long story. Yes. Uh, Professor. Hey, apparently, let me mention yeah. one thing. Mm. In 1948, by the way, by an ax a small accident of history, mm. we Ugandans would not be in Uganda. In fact, there was a proposal by the British mm. to the UN, since Uganda was under British rule, yes. that the, 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 the Jews throughout Europe where, who, don't, who don't have a homeland mm. should be settled in Uganda. It was a proposal put yes, to them. Yes. And I think it was Northern Uganda, right? No, mm. I think they were going to Northern Uganda, but I think gradually the whole of Uganda, they wanted to push us <laughs> to Tanzania, others to push us to Kenya since they were under British rule mm. and create a homeland of the Jews in here, it is the Jews who refuse. They say, our spirit of Zion, we want to go back to Zion, mm. Mount Zion, Jerusalem, or whatever. Mm. But otherwise, they are going to come back here, and maybe today, mm. we Ugandans will be fighting these Jews. <laughs> That's <laughs> an interesting... people need to know that history. That's an interesting... But one. our accident of history, Uganda was going to be the Jewish territory. Wow. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, Uganda survived many things. I, no. mean, I remember, I remember I, there was a report at the colonial office that uh, one of the reasons they didn't make us a colony was mosquitoes. So, they, <laughs> so it wasn't good for, <laughs> for, for the settlers. Yeah, but uh, before, before we move on, uh, Professor, there is Zionism, there is Judaism, and there are Jews. Mm. Could you break down for, for our viewers um, the the difference between those because I, I I think people put there are some Jews who are for example supporting Palestine. 
then there are, there are Zionists, and then there are Judaists, Judaism. Judaism. So what is the difference between? The uh, difference is not easy to find, but by and large, people in Israel are called Jews. Yeah. Or Israelis. Mm. Or Israelis, I don't know what it is. So it's an ethnicity. Judaism, Judaism is the religion of the Jews. Oh, and sorry, sorry. it is uh, actually the precursor of Christianity. Mm. By the way, let the listeners out there, there are some listeners out there who think that the Israelis or the Jews, the people in Israel, are <laughs> Christians. Mm. People in Israel are not Christians. Mm. The Jews are Judaists or Jews for that matter. Mm. That is their faith. And they don't believe in Christianity. Mm. The majority of them, the, 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 the Christians are also discriminated, those who are living in Israel. Mm. So we have to make that distinction. So Judaism is a religion of the Jews. What, in simple terms. They're, they're now, also Zionism... They're, they're, for example, Ugandans who are Judaists. Well, there are those mm -hmm. by, by, by Udaya from Mumbare who mm -hmm. claim that they are also Jews, but I don't know how much they are accepted in, <laughs> in Israel, but that's mm -hmm. a different matter. Yes. But uh, Zionism is uh, like uh, you would say in, in, in Islam now today, we talk about political Islam. Mm -hmm. Political Islam is a movement of certain Muslims who want... To, 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 to mix politics and Islam mm. and use Islam as a tool for capturing power and the state. Mm. So is Zionism. Mm. Zionism is a political tool of the Jews, of a certain kind of Jews mm. for the creation of a Jewish state mm. in the Middle East and being strong against other forces like the Arabs. Mm. So there are people who are not Extremists who may not be Zionists in that sense that they have extreme uh, Jewish nationalism. Mm. They are Orthodox Jewish who actually don't want to be contented with what they, ha they have now. They want to take the Eastern Bank. Mm. You know, there is West Bank, mm. the Gaza Strip, and Golan Heights where the Palestinians are mm. and which have settlements. But there are Orthodox Jews who would want to take over Jordan Mm. The Easter Bank. Yes. They would want to take over Syria. Mm. They would take. They want to take over uh, uh, even the Lebanon, mm. the, the, the neighboring states. Those are extreme Jews, but there are those moderate Jews, and uh, there are those who actually sympathize with the Palestinian cause, which is a cause of justice. Well, thank you very much for that depth of of of, of context, uh, Professor. Um, over to you, Mr. Sheno. Are we? In this discussion around the Israel-Palestine question, the word apartheid normally comes up more and more again. And uh, of course, we see Gaza yesterday, the, the president of Israel saying they are going to, a couple of days ago, saying they are going to put a full siege on supplies to the area. We see the conditions They have already Gaza. done it. Yes. The conditions in Gaza. Does it remind you of apartheid South Africa? You know, it's, um, in a way, it's why uh, uh, Professor had to come in. I have suggested personally, because I'm involved in global campaigns, including very strong and with a very strong view on these matters, maybe that's why mm. I didn't want to go in that way, that, uh, yes, what the Israeli state has done to the Palestinians uh, is, in many cases and in many ways, a tantamount to appetite. Uh, I'm delighted to say that that position is held by many Jews, including former uh, uh, um, shadow foreign secretary of the Labour Party in Britain, who is now a Lord Kaufman, yes. who is a grandson of a Jewish person who will tell you historically how uh, some of his pa parents and grandparents uh, survived uh, the Nazi Germany in Israel and many other places. But um, he says he completely disassociates himself with uh, whatever the extreme right wing in Israel would uh, would be doing and have done and would continue to do. And indeed, yes, Zionism as a, is an ideology that uh, b uh, takes the view that uh, the, the entirety of, uh, of that land is homeland for Jews who must uh, regather from wherever they were, they were in the world and uh, reclaim that land and dispose of uh, everybody else. Unfortunately, uh, that is a view that seems to be um, uh, held by um, many friends, some of them very dubious friends, including some people in Africa, who have actually no clue about the underlying issues of the struggles in, 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 in the Middle East, part of which has been uh, uh, suggested by, 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 by 
uh, our good professor here. In terms of um, uh, your question, it must be recalled that actually 1995, 1995, around the time, yeah, no, not so long ago, <laughs> an Israeli Prime Minister, Rijak Rabin, was assassinated November, I think November 4th, mm. 1995, assassinated by an extremist Zionist Israeli uh, on the basis that uh, he was selling away Israel. Now, Rabin was amongst the most um, decorated Woodridge. Israeli war generals, mm. you know, one of the most charismatic leaders in recent times. Mm. And in Israel, <laughs> power and leadership and militarism is a thing that comes together. Mm. This guy rises to the rank, takes over the Labour Party leadership, becomes a prime minister, and rides his campaigns, you know, very, by and large, actually, to, to their credit, very democratic, Israel as a state. Yes. If you take away the question of Palestine, their foreign policy position, and indeed regional policy on, as Palestine, it's a very democratic space, you know. Mm. Radically goes and campaigns and wins election on um, the two-state solution as a proposal, seeking that, uh, you know, in the event that he became prime minister and did was prime minister, seeking to waken up radical Jews in Israel to the reality of the imperativeness of Jews living side by side with Arabs, mm. well, and in this case, Palestinians, one. And then number two, seeking to push as far back as possible, back to the UN Resolution 242, those days, in our Makira days, if you didn't know what it was, mm. then you are not yet uh, uh, an acclaimed <laughs> a student of, of, of current affairs. Mm. Resolution 242 that uh, was unanimously agreed in the following the 1967 war, mm. pushing for um, a settlement in which Israel would pull back to the pre-1967 uh, borders. That resolution, interestingly, People shouted, some of us shouted in rallies in Kampala, I think, <laughs> rallies in Kampala, in London, or around the world, asking Israel to obey, respect that. Mm, mm. So when you talk about global diplomacy and hypocrisy, ask the Americans when it's convenient. Ask them fellows, particularly the right-wing lot in Anglo-America, mm. uh, when it's convenient. And ask Museven and some of his friends when it comes to hypocrisy. And, and, and international law, good enough for you and, and, and Sarah, are, are lawyers. So those are the things, actually, in, as a matter of interest, if we basically literally stuck to those, may, may be, it might be actually easier. Because sometimes um, um, we were talking about Ukraine, we were talking about, uh, particularly Ukraine and the hypocrisy, I think Sarah was talking about, you know, what do you do, you know? Um, how can you come out and condemn alleged occupation of Ukraine? Mm. And here, there is a unanimous UN resolution, mm. which is 50 years old, <laughs> you mm. know? Mm. And the countries that don't respect it are Israel, Britain, and their usual uh, um, boy fr friends, three, four, five of them. That is the problem there. So, um, and then again, as you said, linked to your question, an Israeli prime minister comes and talks about a blockade and a total blockade. Mm. An Israeli defense minister comes and talks about uh, uh, how uh, uh, Arabs or Palestinians in this case uh, are not human beings. And I know, thankfully, I'm very much delighted that my name is Joseph. Mm. And I, I believe fundamentally given to me Joseph of the Bible. And permanently, I think about many of these things and say, look, fellow citizens, particularly the young guys who get take, sometimes are pushed by dogma, you know, civ civ the civic space, pushed by dogma. Just ask yourselves, if Jesus came here and sat with us here today, if Jesus landed in, in Tel Aviv today, mm. what would Jesus say? Mm. Just think about, particularly you Africans who follow some of these gays, some of, of these things dogmatically. Mm. What would Jesus say? Mm. I am totally, totally, totally a Jesus man. He's my man. You know, just as Milton Bode is my political man. Mm. But no, I know Jesus would not side with the Netanyahu regime in, in Tel Aviv. But of course, yes, Jesus would equally condemn anybody who picks up funny, dubious things and throws a bomb, whether it's in the Uluweru, in Kampala, and oh, indeed what the Hamas guys do. But what is the context? These guys are basically fighting a, a battle for claiming their own space, as I said, which was occupied. Mm. And continuously over the years, if you see what uh, 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 the Israeli state has done, in, particularly in the la last 20 years, mm. where <laughs> the army wakes up in the morning, comes in the morning, 
and then goes to a particular community, mm. it raises off a particular village, mm. literally pushing people, ordinary police, people live there for generations like mm. uh, Professor is talking about, you mm. know, and then <laughs> the next day they're giving those land, a little, this is the Zionist thing, mm. to a, a Ritani Israeli family uh, from, uh, from, uh, from say America, South Africa, or wherever it is. It's completely unacceptable. Yeah. I happen to be one of those people who completely believes that uh, in a, a future UPC government in which I've got capacity and power, you know, I would create an enabling environment in which there is settlement for Africans who are taken as slaves uh, to the Caribbeans to, to settle them somewhere within Uganda. Mm. And indeed to have a conversation. And see, this is a serious point. Mm. You know, at the, at the, 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 the AU in Addis Ababa, that those other fellow Africans of ours in Japan, J Jamaica, wherever else they are, willing to return, we create an environment which for them to return. Yeah. But you can't do that by bombing an entire village because you're, re you're reclaiming space for, for some of our people. Yeah. In fact, this would be very interesting. Imagine doing that by bombing off a particular corner of Boa, South Africa, occupied by the whites. Just think about it. Mm. Think about bombing, away, clearing some white settlers in, 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 in Kenya, mm. occupied by, by, by Anglo-American people. Mm. How, would you do that? Of course, it's commonsensically you wouldn't do that. So that is part of what's happening in the Holy Land. So the Holy Land, yes, is a place claimed by both sides. It's a place where <laughs> history and dogma cannot help but reality has been suggested. Common sense, justice, and reality that human beings are born the same. And that, whether they're Philistines or whoever they are, mm. if Jesus came and we applied his justice, no, it would be a situation that the future, go, way, the, the, the future for that land is a two-state solution where Palestine, Palestinians live side by side with Israel as independent state. A final quick one on here. Yes, yes. I grew and saw the extremes of either side. The time where the, when Yasser Arafat of, uh, 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 of PLO was the acceptable one. And then the Hamases and others were the terrorists and the unacceptable guys. Mm. But I also saw Yasser Arafat uh, blackmailed and betrayed. Mm. Some people even argue that perhaps his death would have been, might have been compromised. Mm. So I saw a time when, is it? Is it? Is, is, it, is, is it Egypt? Um, would Egypt uh, sit? Would Egyptian authorities sit with uh, uh, Israeli diplomats or authorities? Um, time when you could you, not, you could you not think, think about. PLO has lost relevance. In in a way, yes, but I think that's part of the conversation. I'm just saying principally where PLO was the liberal, of, the much more moderate, accepted organization mm. at the time when the whole of Arab world were possibly radically opposed, mm. but the Arab countries. Where they pick Jordan, Syria, Iraq. You know, there was this other thing that, do you accept that Israel has got a right to exist? Mm. What the Israeli extremists have always argued is that these Arabs are a threat to their existence. Mm. That these Arabs are saying that, well, you know, we can't live with them. Sam. That's why every other time you hear this thing about Israeli security, mm. our security, our security. That's why I was giving you that background. Yeah. It has moved to the extent that even Saudi Arabia, would otherwise be presented as a radical um, Muslim, Islam, Muslim country, you know, came into accepting that they should have diplomatic relations with Israel. Mm -hmm. All that what these Arab neighboring countries want is a situation in which the Palestinians have a home, the Palestinians also have a right to return, mm. <laughs> international law, and the Palestinians also have a right to dignity to live side by side with mm. who? With the Israelis. Mm. Is the Israelis who have the bombs, and the big bombs, and most of those big bombs supplied by America. The mm. other side, well, they create, whatever is created is a ball created under the extremism. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sheno. And uh, hopefully, uh, uh, when you spoke of uh, space to resettle African-Americans, mm. reminded me of the words of um, uh, the minister, Louis Farrakhan, mm -hmm. from the US. Um, one time he asked that African-Americans in prison, because there are apparently over six million, one in four, black males be returned to Africa. Mm. And the, this white presenter was shaken. Mm -hmm. Then he said, why is this idea so weird to you? Mm -hmm. And yet you could go to a land <laughs> totally, uh, you, you go to Palestine and totally put a new, uh, you know, new group order. of people there. Mm -hmm. And why is it so weird that you can't give us our black sons to take back to Africa? And 
it was a very interesting discussion of the possibility of, of the return of such. But yeah, no, no, race and identity and power is, is, is a terrible thing. Mm. And global hypocrisy is, uh, is, is at the heart of these things. And as I said, the day when uh, America um, ceases to see itself as master and boss, mm. and the day America and its close allies, that unfortunately includes a certain element of uh, uh, Israelis, mm. you know, and say the British, I think the more likely we shall come to the reality that uh, yeah. uh, to the end, mini end of Cold War, and then the world community can begin to yeah. to, to fight against the, 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 the biggest threat, which is now a uh, threat with the, yeah. the, the environmental degradation. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you very much. I I'd like to come to you, uh, Dr. Birete. Um, this war has been one with, the, the, the war has been as strong as, as the propaganda itself. Uh, a few days ago, BBC released a tweet that 500 Palestinians died um, in Gaza, and then 700 Israelis killed <laughs> in, 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 one, in, one, in, one, in one tweet. These ones died, 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 were killed. Yeah. What do you make of the whole you know, the, the propaganda? Whole Actually, today, propaganda. most of them are in southern. Mm. They say yeah. Israelis are 1,300. Yeah. Mm. I don't know, Palestinians are 1,500. Mm. Yeah. But one die, one group dies. But it's the tone. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, 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 are, they, they are the politics of language. Yeah. No, no, my take really, I, I won't defer much from the previous speakers. Mm. If you look at the genesis of the conflict, for the record, when we were growing up, there were about three figures mm. fighting for justice. Of, of the first one, of course, being the South African Mandela, apartheid yes. situation and Mandela, mm. uh, yes, Arafat, and then uh, Somalia, yeah. the Siad Bari. Yes. So you would listen to international news, yes. and then these three names yes. are not missed. Mm. So we had to, you know, it, it caused curiosity from that tender age. Mm. You're like, why can't war? In these countries, yes, and, 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 yes. and other than South Africa, of course, where there is a semblance of peace, but also high income inequalities. Mm. And South Africa has the highest income inequality in Africa, mm. and of course, its its root cause is is apartheid. Yep, yes. Yes. But 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 uh, Somalia and, and and Palestine are, are still in war. So for all my generation, mm. these countries have been fighting. Mm. So it's very unfortunate. Mm. So starting from uh, the the UN, the first UN resolution of 1947, mm. that that's the first time when UK was handing over mm. the, the mandate the uh, to the UN of Palestine, mm. and UN passed a resolution 181 mm. on mm -hmm. the two-state solution, mm -hmm. creating the Arab state and the Jewish state out of, of Palestine. It was never respected. Mm. That map exists. Mm. When you look at the territory, territorial division by, by resolution 181, most of the land that was gazetted as Arab state mm. or Palestine has been eaten up mm. by, 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 by Israel or Jewish state, mm. showing the extent of the occupation that has lasted 56 years. From then, there has been several attempts mm. to, to resolve the conflict, including the Oslo Agreement, the 1978 Camp David Agreement, which mm. is similar, still on the two-state solution, mm. with the five steps on final settlement mm. of the situation. The Camp David decision was bypassed by the Judea, Judea Agreement, mm. which excluded Palestine. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, then the, the hypocrisy, the aggressiveness, the double standards, mm. especially of the bigger, the superpowers, mm -hmm. On the Palestine situation, I, I find it really something that the world should not settle for. Mm. We cannot treat people different. I'm a human rights defender. Mm. All humans are the same. Precisely. So when you start condemning, yes, all deaths are unfortunate. Mm. But when you have global leaders saying they are condemning the killing of Israelis and then they are silent on Palestine as if Palestine are animals. Mm. And unfortunately, the Minister of Defense of Israel yes, yes. has officially called Palestine human animals. Mm. Yes. I think this should be triable. It's a war crime. Mm. It should be triable in the International Criminal Court. Mm. How do you call a fellow human being a human animal? Mm. What, what gives you the audacity mm. to, to say such things?
So when you look at the, for me, the human rights mm. violations, mm. excessive human rights violations, children, women, have always been the biggest victims mm. of, of the bombings. Mm. 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 Yes, Arafat lived all his life in a bunker. Mm. 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 Bombed all the time, and then you would hear news. Yes, Arafat is being bombed, and as a child, you know, you think of these people. Like, how inhuman can you be? Mm. And, and Western cartoons would make fun of him. Of course. <laughs> the following day. Of course, because the media <laughs> propaganda yeah. is yeah. tilted against mm. the Palestinian mm. the Palestine people. So, what is the end game? Mm. What is the end game? Do leaders ever reflect? To, to ask and say, um, how will this conflict could, end? Could, could it be because of the, the lobby, the lobby culture of the U.S.? We all know um, um, the Jews have strong lobby communities, including the American Jewish Association, but also Not, they are powerful you know, business. Yes, the Jewish are, are lobbying, and mm. unfortunate for Africa, S then we have the misunderstanding That's a fact, yeah. of Israel mm. with a biblical Israel. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, when you go to the Bible, <laughs> mm. Genesis 49, 28. Mm. And, and I'm going to cite this. Mm. Because Jacob was faithful, mm. the Lord gave him a special name of Israel, mm. which means one who prevails with God or let God prevail. Mm -hmm. Biblical dictionary, Israel 508. Jacob, had, the, the, so that's the meaning of Israel. Mm. But we misunderstand this biblical Israel with the world uh, Israel nation mm. that is at the heart of, of, of apartheid and human rights violations mm. in Gaza. It's not the same. I know that the whole lands, by coincidence, are in the, 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 the same region, but Israel does not mean that's what they had for who? Let me yes. a little bit. Yes. <laughs> those justifications, yeah. those sacred history justifications. First of all, the Jews believe are a chosen race, mm. are a chosen people. Mm. But so are the Muslims. The mm. Muslims also are a chosen. Mm. We the Christians, the Christians, we also say we are the chosen. Mm. Actually, we say we are the new Israel. Mm. Now, if we are going to continue justifying injustices mm. around chosen, chosen. Mm. Who is chosen? Even South Africans, <laughs> these Boers in South Africa, the Africaners, they, they also claimed they were chosen, even if they are, by the way, they were feminists. Mm. But they said they were also chosen. In fact, they used the Bible to justify to themselves. Justify Just like the guys who did slavery used the Bible to justify them. But carry on. Mm. So this yes. business of the chosen race, mm. if we follow it up, then the world will have will mm. be split and will be on fire. Mm. The Christians claim they are the new Israel. The mm. other old Israel is, is out. Mm. They are chosen. Mm. They, they, <laughs> the, the Jews are chosen. We also have the, the Muslims are chosen in Uganda. <laughs> 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 so this whole issue of legitimizing power, uh -huh. legitimizing occupation, legitimizing uh, discrimination, being chosen, eh? the chosen race, the chosen Jews, the chosen Christians, the chosen Muslims, now they have brought in a new spin, the chosen Matthews. And you must make noise. So just conclude on that biblical distortion. Uh, uh, yeah. Today's the, uh, 2022 report, the mm. Israel 2022 International Religious Freedom Report, mm. shows that 73.8% of Israel population are Jewish. 18% are Muslim. 1.9% mm. are Christians. Could you repeat that, please? Yes. Let me repeat the citation. Mm. Those are Israel, the of Israel. Yes, today. Mm. Israel 2022 International Religious Freedom Report. Mm. According to the country's Central Bureau of Statistics, mm. classification system data, Approximately 73.8% of Israelis are Jewish. 18% mm. are Muslim. 1.9% mm. are Christian. 1.6% mm. 
You're, groups. you're reading this for the Af- the Uganda the Africans. The Africans who think that uh, they, 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 they are in, <laughs> in Christian solidarity with the, with Israel <laughs> apartheid. <laughs> they, they, they are not Christians. Christians. They are not Christians. Yes. So people need to distance the the, mm. the Bible. Mm. From the Israel of Netanyahu and colleagues, mm. they, 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 are, they are not the same. Mm. They are not the same. So having said that, all this injustice mm. can only end when the global hypocrisy mm. of looking at Palestinians as less human mm. ends. It starts with Washington. It starts with the, 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 the Europe. Mm. They should end the dehumanization of mm. Arabs. Yes, yes. I think that's the yeah. only way I can that's find fine. it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, professor, we, I think many people forget that for a long time, um, the apartheid regime was actually legitimate. And it was also, I believe, backed by, by the Western world for, for some time, before, of course, the end of the Cold War. I think you are a lawyer here. I am going to challenge a lawyer. Mm. Apartheid was not legitimate. Mm. It was lawful. L- okay. But okay. it was illegitimate. Yeah. Okay. The two are different. Yeah. Whatever yes. is illegal right. is not is necessary. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you can you, have something you. illegitimate, mm. but which is uh, no. by law. Okay. Okay. Mm. okay. So now you can legitimate, you can uh, legalize mm. injustice. So apartheid was legalizing injustice. Mm. Uh, by the way, to go back to what I had hinted on a little bit, mm. the Boers in South Africa, or the, the so-called Africaners, mm. the white, the Dutch South Africans, mm. uh, when they were also legitimizing their occupation of South Africa and displacing uh, the Africans and the settling there, mm. they also used the Bible. Mm. They said they were a chosen race mm. and that they were being persecuted by the British in the Cape. Mm. So they were running away from Egypt. Mm. Egypt were now Cape and the British. Mm. <laughs> and they were going to the promised land, which was Transvaal mm. and uh, Johannesburg. You know? So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, weaponizing religion mm. and justifying your settlement and occupation and injustice. Mm. So gradually, the Africaners or the Boers in South Africa uh, we are powerful. Mm. They had the arms, mm. and they set up a, legal, a, a regime, a government, an organizational system mm. based on apartheid. That is, that there are people who are superior to others, mm. and those who are superior are not supposed to mix with the others. Mm. And that is what happened until 1994, mm. when South Africa attained the majority rule. Yeah. And the the, 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 the the sense came to the Boers in South Africa. Yeah. What, what, what I was driving to is that it's not the first time the big uh, Western powers have backed the wrong, I mean, something like this. Um, oh, okay, okay. Yes. I can explain and, that one. Yes. You see, the, as the colleagues have already pointed out, mm. there is a lot of hypocrisy among white supremacism. Mm. Mm. There is white supremacism. Yeah. The people of the Western world, the whites, thinking they are a superior race. Mm. Uh, even Hitler, by the way, when he was killing Jews, mm. he was actually responding to this question of the chosen race. Mm. You see, the Jews were saying they were chosen. Mm. They were chosen race. And Hitler said, no, the Aryan race is a chosen race. Mm. Now, the whites think that the whole world should be organized around their image. Mm. They, 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 they think that the whole world is at a lower stage of human development and should be uh, uh, organized around the, 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 the norms of the white race, of the European race. Mm. And their ally in the Middle East is, are the Jews. Yes. So they have consistently supported the, the Jews vis-a-vis some so of those Arabs. So you think the motive is purely white spirit? It is racist. Mm. It is racist and... Uh, it is also tied up with religion because they are Christians mm. and Christianity is an offshoot of Judaism, although even Islam is an offshoot of Judaism. Mm. But I think the biblical story, the Old Testament, ties up more with the Christians, mm. maybe than the Muslims. Mm. Although both all of them are actually Abrahamic faith, yeah. they draw from the same right. tradition mm. and they all have those claims 
the successive people claim they are chosen. Mm. Mm. You see, the Jews originally they claim that they were chosen. Mm. They still claim they are chosen. The, when the, the Christians later also said, uh, uh, when Jesus came, they were chosen. Mm. Actually, they displaced the, the chosen Jews. Mm. And now the Arabs also, when they started their own religion, they said, uh, uh, we are the last chosen. Mm. Now, that is tied up with uh, the racism, <laughs> discrimination, injustice. And also interests. Mm. And interests. No, because, because, yeah, there's the debate that, you know, it could be an interest-driven uh, you know, agenda. Perhaps there's, there's an interest in South Africa. Maybe there's an interest in 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 Israel. Being no, you are right. Uh, I mean, the Jews, or as well as the Africaners in South Africa, the white races in South Africa, mm. we are representing the interests of the Western countries mm. of uh, Europe and America. Mm. And uh, when they are competing for the wealth in the Middle East, mm. they are using Israel. Uh, to neutralize mm. the resistance that they would meet in the Middle East. So they are interested in creating an enclave within the Middle East who is trusted, who is an ally, through whom they can weaken mm. the Arabs and, and take away their wealth. Mm. And that's why you hear this Biden. I heard Biden giving a speech. He was so callous against people who are dying Instead of being neutral enough to say, yes, I am against Hamas mm. using those terrorist methods of killing civilians, but I'm also against Israel using, going, the, same. Going, using the same methods to terrorize the, 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 the Arab Palestinians, mm. destroy their wealth, uh, cut them off from the, the, the rest of the world, cut off power, cut off electricity, cut off food, Cut off medicine, that was, this was terrible mm. to, to come from a Western global leader whom we think that should be neutral enough to mm. say, mm. wait a minute, it seems both of you are right and wrong at the same time, mm. and let us now prevail upon you, let's mm. let both sides restrain themselves, and we find a solution for you. He is supporting one side, he has already sent troops, mm. a, a, a war carrier, Brinken today landed in in Israel on solidarity. What about solidarity of the other people? Are mm. other people less human? And this business of supporting one group against another in terms of injustice, mm. moreover supporting the, the the weaker side. Earlier on, we talked about Pierre O mm. uh, being irrelevant. Who has made it irrelevant? Yeah. Mm. It is the Western world. Mm. You see, PRO was the authority that was representing the, 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 the Palestinians, mm. the Arab mm. Palestinians. Yes. And they, they are the ones who negotiated uh, the Oslo agreements. Yes. yes. And then the, the population expected and the that. Observer status at UN. Yes. And the population of the Arab Palestinians in the, in the West Bank, mm. Gaza, and maybe Golan Heights mm. expected that. The, uh, the Oslo agreements would be... Would deliver. Would deliver. Mm. Now, when it didn't deliver, they lost hope in mm. PRO and the Mohammed Abba, Abbas. Mohammed Abbas is now the one the who replaced uh, Arafat. Mm. Now, they weakened it because it lost legitimacy, going mm. to your word, legitimacy. Yes, yes. So the, 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 the Palestinians lost hope uh, in getting salvation from PRO. Mm. And now they supported Hamas and, and Hezbollah, which mm. is operating from mm. Lebanon. Lebanon. Mm. Now, who has pushed people to support Hamas? Mm. It is a waste for failing to actualize the Oslo agreements of a two-state solution. We can the PLO authority. Mm. So, the moderate PLO, which would be negotiating with Israel the way forward, was weakened by the Western powers, mm. especially USA, and it has given way to the terrorists, the, the, the so-called terrorists, the, mm. that is the, 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 the radicals, mm. Hamas and Hezbollah. Hamas actually has been fending for the Palestinians. It mm. is the one which has been giving them And food. I think it originally wasn't uh, radical as it is. And the Western uh, methods of not fulfilling mm. and actualizing 
the Oslo agreement mm. has radicalized them. Mm. I mean, they have reached a point of, of no return. When you reach a point of no return, mm. you agree for a two-state solution, and instead of uh, actualizing it, you deal that around, then you continue to be occupied, dominated, more settlements, mm. is, uh, Jerusalem is taken over, mm. they are fighting over the Alaka Mosque, you, they, 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 they go and discreet it, and you just keep quiet, so you fall into the hands of the extremists. Mm. So extremism is evolving around the failure of the UN and the Western so, world. So it's an extreme reaction. It is an extreme reaction, which is mm. understandable. Mm. How do we remove that extremism from Hamas and Hezbollah? Mm. You have to actually be fair and bring justice. By the way, Hamas mm. is supposed to be Sunni. Mm. But for some reason, because the West and Israel has continued to dominate them and oppress them and they, they have no way of going around, mm. they have now gone to Iran to get weapons because Iran is supposed to be Shia. Shia yes. And yet uh, Hamas is Sunni. Mm. But you see, a dying man clings to a serpent. Mm. The, the Hamas has said, come and buy and buy. Mm. Let us go to anybody <laughs> because we have no yes. way out other yeah. than finding... Yeah. Any weapon that can get rid of mm. these people who are oppressing us, mm. colonizing us, apathizing us, and what is the solution? Because people were born into those into those enclaves, mm. those strips, as refugees. Mm. Fifty years down the road, you are still a refugee. Mm. What do you do? In my language, they say, mm. "When are we not dying anyway? We are already dying." Yeah. You can see how people go how they went to Israel and committed suicide. Yes. You see, to, for, for a human being to, to decide to commit suicide mm. is not an easy decision. It is not that it is in the bone. It is because there is an injustice upon that person or that community, mm. and they have no way forward. Mm. So they just go and commit suicide as they also kill civilians, which is very unfortunate. Mm. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a saying that a cornered man fights with the might of all ah, his yes, ancestors. They have too. Yeah. I would like to um, ask you, Mr. Shen, on the issue of the of the solutions. Uh, of course, the the two-state two solution has taken a lot of uh, support globally and uh, has been <coughs> crystallized in several accords like the Oslo, which we talked about. There's also the one-state solution, which of course um, has the reality that the Palestinians are still uh, more populous than than the Israel than the than the, the Israelis Jews. or the Jews. Do you think then that uh, we are seeing uh, what the politics mean, of what, what do you mean they are more populous? The, 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 the population of the Palestinians is bigger than that of the, the Jews. Um, so I look it, look yeah, I but, but you, my question being um, do you think we are seeing the politics of strategic ambiguity? Um, no, um, I, I think uh, the two-state solution is uh, the, the answer, mm. is the imperative. Ironically, it might appear that um, what Hamas did in the last week by um, launching the fiercest and mm. uh, possibly the most courageous <laughs> attack yeah, on Israel suicide. and uh, possibly causing the, the, the biggest... <laughs> possibly historical casualties on Israeli state since their mm. formation uh, may just but be the case that uh, when and whenever this settles, and we don't know how far it's going to go, yes. considering the fact that Israel is, is, is governed by an extremely excessly right-wing prime minister, we don't know what kind of response they're going to be. Mm. Um, I, I don't think that, that that country or the sub-region is going to be the same again. Um, we may just have to go back to a negotiated uh, settlement at some mm. stage. Mm. But really before that, you know, you, you're asking Professor and Sarah Machali. Yes. The, the, the issues are clear. Um, there is geopolitics, um, which is being played by Anglo-America. Mm. There is race and racism being played by Anglo-America and global uh, Anglo-Saxon, uh, 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 if you like, <laughs> racial dominance. Mm. And then there is uh, um, the powerful... Jewish lobby, which is the most powerful lobby on earth, mm. uh, and uh, the Jewish lobby drives this. The Jewish lobby, uh, almost suddenly, in many cases, been suggested, uh, elects oh. and appoints an American president. 
to the extent that this very same guy, Netanyahu, do you can imagine, for an American president, you know, uh, and to get in a prime minister, or in a leader, in a country, mm. to go to America <laughs> and rebuke a sitting American president, it can only be done by an Israel prime minister, and unusually. I didn't expect that it would come from an Israel prime minister, and it came from this Netanyahu man mm. uh, at Barack Obama. Some people suggested and insinuated that he could only do so because Obama was a, a democratic president and almost certainly a black man mm. in, in, in Washington. And, and, and because if it wasn't, possibly there was going to be a big backlash. So those are, those are the things. Now, the broader uh, geopolitical element is this, that Israel, I think as Professor suggested, is merely a satellite state mm. for the West, meaning that, um, remember, Israel is among was it the fourth most powerful army on Earth uh, with all American equipment tested in, in, in Israel. Mm. So basically at Israel, you, you, check, you check Saudi Arabia, you check the entirety of the Middle East, Minus now the, the, the threatening power of uh, of of of, of uh, China, yeah. of China for yeah, continuous time. You know, but I'm coming to Iran. I'm, 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 I'm coming to Iran. <laughs> In fact, mm. continuously when Iran and Iraq was being bashed, mm. the assessment was whether or not they could come to at par with Israel. Mm. And uh, whenever Iran shot up, it was whether or not Iran could be at par, or any country, or which country within the Middle East could neutralize or compete with Israel. Mm. So that is the whole thing. But why Israel? Israel primarily for the reasons that I've given. Mm. So, th so that is the, the global element. But finally, Sarah talks uh, about uh, this very interesting statistics of 1.8% uh, of 1.9% uh, of uh, Christians uh, in Israel. Lest other Africans forget, um, Idi Amin was actually uh, a creation of uh, of 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 uh, of Anglo America using Israel, mm. so the Israelis uh, told Amin mm. that what was going to arrest him over uh, uh, Congo and uh, and uh, and the killing of Brigadier Koya, you know, and and the Congo gold things, and so we can help you to make sure that it doesn't happen. Mm. Israel did that not for itself. Israel did that in part for itself, but in part for Anglo America mm. because of what he was fighting uh, American interests in Congo. Mm. So you need to neutralize this guy. So lest we forget, whatever happened out of Idi Amin, fellow Christian Ugandans should observe and know, including the eventual killing of the Archbishop by Idi Amin, you can actually trace it back to Israel. Now, in that time, do you think these Israeli Jewish uh, uh, guys from Tel Aviv were silly to, to, to dance with this Muslim guy? So Africans, let's wake up and begin to also act strategically and think broadly be away from our dogma. Or else we're just basically being used like um, basic equipment on the table. So mm. and that's the lesson we need to learn here. So for those in this part, of course, today, <laughs> even if uh, Comrade Awiche uh, would normally be here, uh, I'm not quite sure we're going to take a different position on this. Mm. So this is actually, thankfully, the predominant view around the world. And of course, I follow social media and many other things, including what is happening in British Parliament and, and British government, mm. where, where I, have, I continue to have an interest. No, the popular view is actually generally very much <laughs> anti-Israeli anti because of Israeli's track record. Mm. And so the world is soon coming Including to... Including younger Jews, especially the Gen Z. Younger progressive Jews. And as, as, yeah. as, as, as I said, the majority of them, the Israeli prime minister <laughs> was, was assassinated. The assassinated prime minister. So which, which average Ugandan Christian, as a matter of interest, which average Ugandan Christian wants to convince this panel that for them they are much more lovers of Israel and Judaism than Yisrael could have been the assassinated prime minister. So who? You know, so mm. which other Ugandan Christian can tell me that they're actually much more convictionist than uh, uh, um, uh, Gerald Kaufman, the, the former shadow foreign secretary for, for the Labour Party, as I said, this is you. So who? So that is a wake-up thing for Africa, and that's why it's important we're discussing this. Mm. And on the civic space, maybe beyond whatever's happening there, this mm. should be a wake-up opportunity for, for but, us to begin. But we should yeah. not be mistaken to say that we are supporting no. terrorism. No, 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 no. no, no. Hamas. No. We are not. No. Any terrorism is terrorism, and Hamas shouldn't be killing civilians in, in Israel. However, we are trying to show the origin, the, mm. the genesis of this uh, terrorist mind Mm. of the Hamas, it is because they have been pushed into a corner mm. in the strip, you can imagine people who were owning the whole of Israel, because mm. the whole of Israel was Palestinian land for 1,000 years more mm. than 1,000 years mm. and then they were pushed into 
an enclave, and even there, they have followed they them have up. No freedom. They have no freedom there. They, 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 they cannot uh, access outside world without permission. They yeah. are always uh, on, uh, to roadblocks. Others are in uh, refugee camps. Mm. So uh, you, I, a, a, any human being can be a terrorist, by the way, when mm. he's pushed into a corner. Mm. Because this is a matter of life and death. But we are not supporting terrorism mm. or just uh, unleashing terror onto a population. Mm. But we are saying both groups are using religion and other ideologies to justify violent mm. uh, uh, extremism, yeah. Yeah. Uh, violent terror. Mm. But however, what is the origin? What is the cause? Mm. What is the, 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 the genesis of this? We are saying if there is justice, then we can easily condemn whoever starts terrorism. Mm. But let there be justice according to international law Mm. and international norms and international standards, not just all of them, both of them <laughs> resorting to sacred history. Mm. If we go to sacred history, we shall go to yeah. Batwezi and everything. <laughs> we'll never be solved because both of them can yeah. justify their being there. Can Canaanites and mm. Philistines have mm. been in that area. Mm. The Jews, the Israelis have been in that area for millennia. Let's move away from using sacred history yeah. To justify any violent terror. Yeah. yeah, I know we need to go to a break. So let me yeah. just conclude mm. what, what you're saying, Machali. That um, um, when uh, one of the reasons of this extremism, and which is just to underscore that, because I was going to, to actually make sure that I put that disclaimer, mm. was that um, when Yasser Arafat and PLO were actually pushing for a negotiated settlement, you go for a negotiated settlement, you know, uh, you give. And the other side gives nothing. Mm. You give, and the other side gives nothing. So the more um, PLO got humiliated, round table and globally, mm. the more their citizens, uh, their and, and their their followers watched. And then they, they they said that well, we have no nothing on the table for us. And then they sought to rally around the much more radical view. You could actually pick on this. Um, let me use the FDC thing. I know time, we don't have much time. Mm. Where people, some people say, let's yeah. go to the street or let's go to a negotiated settlement. Mm. Or let's go to the bush and let's take a negotiated settlement. Mm. So if negotiation is not giving you anything, yeah. if your leaders continue to get humiliated, mm. you get a radicalized yeah. population. And that is how it happened. And finally, yeah. Hamas eventually got elected in uh, Gaza. Mm. You know, as a Hamas government. And the political party elected, gets the majority vote. And you know what? Israel made it impossible for them to govern democratically. Mm. Meaning that these guys were pushing aside arms and coming to through the democratic process mm. that we in UPC know. Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to take Dr. Biretes uh, Sorry. before the break. Uh, mm. we, we have a bike at about time. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Road forward, so I, I cannot Sorry. I cannot miss her. But um, mm. doctor, uh, do you think we are headed for a world war? There's an arms race. The world is getting multipolar. We have Ukraine. We have uh, China, Taiwan brewing. Do you think these are the fertile conditions that were there in 1914 or 1939? If I come to that, as a student of international humanitarian law, mm. I want to underscore my disappointment with the UN mm. in executing its mandate. Mm. The UN was established to resolve conflicts, such mm. as that of Israel-Palestine. Mm. After the end of World War III, mm. the world thought mm. we would not have such prolonged mm. conflicts between states, mm. especially where the members are members of, of the UN. Yes. Both Israel and, and the other su its supporters are members of the UN, including UN Security Council, especially, mm. you know, uh, the UK, US, and and. and uh, and, and France and, and, and other countries, mm. Russia with the veto powers are the permanent members of UN Security Council and China. Mm. When you look at the 15 non-permanent members of the UN Security Council, eight of them have recognized Palestine mm. as an independent state. And that's why the emergency meeting of the UN Security Council mm. in, on Sunday failed to issue a statement because mm. for the UN Security Council to issue a statement, they must achieve consensus mm. by all members. Mm. First, Russia is against the aggression of Israel, 
and yes. it has veto powers, mm -hmm. but also the eight non-permanent members that have recognized Palestine as an independent state, mm -hmm. then cannot go against their mm -hmm. diplomatic decisions. Mm -hmm. As of today, more than 75% of the UN members, mm -hmm. member states have recognized Palestine as an independent state. Mm -hmm. So for me, my disappointment with the UN is that why can't it prevail? Because the UN Security Council in April this mm. year mm. repeated its commitment to the two-state solution. Mm. Why don't they prevail over the extremists on both sides mm. and push mm. through with the two-state solution yes. to its conclusion? Because as of last, you know, two years ago, I attended the meeting of the Committee on Palestine. Mm. And I know we are hosting the non-aligned conference mm. early next year as Uganda and, and, and the heart of their at the heart of the non-aligned movement is the question of Palestine mm. and they unanimously support the independence of Palestine. Mm. So by then as the stalemate goes on on, on on the decisions, Israel continues to construct settlements mm. in the mm. contested lands mm. in Gaza Strip. Mm. And better Yes. And so that, that's for the, me the biggest doctor, doctor, disappointment. The, the, uh, earlier this year, the Secretary General uh, Guterres actually made a speech where he said that we should not expect, uh, he, he said the UN is the mean of, of the world. It's the, the mean average. So we should not expect uh, magic or anything special from them. Does but he understand merely, his mandate? Merely, or maybe he merely, needs merely to resign. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because uh, the charter, the UN charter is very clear. Too much from No, the UN. the UN charter is very clear. If the current Secretary General feels overwhelmed, mm. I, he, he has room to resign. Yeah. Actually, I should have expected the Secretary General of UN to be in the Middle East today. Yes, he should Why have should listed. Bring he should have... Secretary of State for years first to be in that territory before the UN Secretary General. Yes. He should be the one there. If he feels overwhelmed, he should resign. The charter is very clear. Mm. Or if he's biased. Yeah. Yeah. The UN yeah. Secretary General is failing us. Yeah. So this so. is the failure of UN and we must condemn it. UN has a role to play in maintaining global peace. Mm. And this peace is not being maintained. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. As uh, we go into a break, I reflect on, uh, on the story of a lady called Joan Stanley, a British uh, officer uh, within the research around nuclear weapons. Um, she actually leaked um, details to the KGB, who at the time were moving towards mm. nuclear, but they hadn't advanced as much as the mm. Allies, the Western Allies. So she believes that her leaking, which enabled Russia to finally discover nuclear, mm. is what has caused was world peace, because <laughs> including the 1963 question, mm. the Chuban missile crisis, yeah. the fact that there are, there are missiles pointing at each other mm. is what causes world peace, and not the UN. And the balance the, of terror. Yes, the balance the, of terror. <laughs> as a deterrence. As a deterrence. As a deterrence. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps that is, you didn't answer the question, but perhaps that's what's going <laughs> No, there will be no world war. Yes. There will be no world war. That's Answer your the question. The balance of terror. Yeah, there will be no world war. No, but we accident. condemn mm. bias. We condemn double standards. Mm. We condemn hypocrisy. Mm. We condemn the inaction of yes. the UN and its institutions. But there can be an accident of history with these nationalist leaders we are having, the likes of Putin and Trump. Mm. He can release the, the weapon and the other side releases. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, interesting discussion there. We shall proceed uh, with these matters uh, in the second segment. Stick with us here. It's the Citizens Chat Show uh, here on Civic Space TV. The Citizens Chat Room happens every Friday at 2 p.m. on Civic Space TV online on Facebook and YouTube. We invite you to be part of this conversation. Civic Space TV. Freedom always. Thank you very much, our dear viewers, for sticking with us. Uh, we had a very interesting discussion in the first segment around the war uh, that has been going on, um, that is going on or brewing in Israel, Palestine. Uh, of course, our very capable professor taking us back thousands of years and uh, urging that we should not uh, rationalize things uh, based on the, the idea of chosen race because then each one of us is chosen in one way or the other but moving fast forward uh, of, of course we also discussed our our intents of uh, not not condoning what is happening with hamas and terrorist methods but urging that 
humanitarian law uh, internationally or humanitarianism should should stand under all circumstances. Uh, fast forward, we are moving to discuss, of course, uh, the independence of Uganda. This week in Kitgum, uh, we celebrated 61 years as a, a nation. Uh, I don't know this the, the, how how <laughs> if my colleagues will agree, but as a nation, of course, as uh, a country, as a <laughs> as a country, in the words of Professor, and uh, we are going to discuss just. Uh, reflections on what that means, what that journey has been, uh, where we are, and of course, what we hope for the future. And uh, this time, I hope you don't deflect, uh, considering you're, you're starting a conversation of independence has to start with with UPC. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, I would still have uh, deflected, because mm. uh, we, are, we are fairly objective here. This is a mature panel, and of course, uh, we regard Professor as the literary historian, yes. but uh, by all means, um, um, yes, you talk about Kitgum. Kitgum was, in my opinion, um, a coming down of space for Mr. Museveni to, 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 to soil what would otherwise be independence. Mm. Uh, you talk about 61 years, uh, my, my, my own considered opinion, indeed, is that um, we are not independent. And mm. number two, that even then, when we got independent, uh, in 1962, I'm not quite sure whether the people of Kitgum have actually felt uh, uh, that independence at all for a long time because uh, these are people talking about uh, some of uh, uh, the uh, accidents of politics when Amin came to power in 1971, um, backed by Israel, by the way. Um, Amin uh, targeted particularly Lango, Acholi communities and uh, initially and then followed in the next year by other local communities, including my own jobs and others. And mm -hmm. then, of course, eventually, then he targeted every other Ugandan mm -hmm. whom he felt first were UPC, Botelini, or anybody else eventually in the last mm -hmm. year, anybody who would be considered a threat to him or an obstacle to, to, to his object. Mm -hmm. So I, I truly particularly suffered hugely gracefully mm -hmm. uh, against Amin in the 70s and and of course, including losing its big Archbishop Janani Luum, yes. losing its big, uh, um, uh, as it's claimed would be, um, Army Commander Brigadier Okoya, and, and many other top citizens. Mm. Uh, uh, that is Kitku. But of course, then we return to um, multipartism in the 80s, and then of course, then Museveni comes. And then in between Museveni, 38 years, you know, 16, 17, 18, nearly 20 of those years. The many people in Acholi, you know, lived in concentration camps. So, as of this week, you know, for the 61 years, what, how many years of those have the people of Acholi, in this case, uh, particularly Kitgum, experienced peace? If you drive uh, between Gulu and, uh, and Kitgum, and I was there not so long ago, you look in between well, the, both sides of the road, you see grass thatched, uh, struggling homesteads under particularly surviving mango trees mm. and uh, only rarely would you see a homestead where you see life and hope uh, and and so for that when i look back to then what happened in 1962 which was an important uh, independence uh, a moment for all of us and i think the three of us have had the privilege of sharing this in other networks mm. um the idea of independence then was that uh, Ugandans, just like other Africans uh, were, were, had attained and were claiming for, would claim the seats of governance, you know, take over uh, or, or, uh, ownership and, 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 and destiny of, of our continents, in this case our country, Uganda, mm -hmm. and make sure that we have leadership with a mandate, mm -hmm. a leadership that would respect the rule of law, leadership that would do like what, what was trying to say and expect of Israel, uh, uh, would ensure that uh, all citizens uh, uh, are protected under the law, all leadership, all, mem all citizens share in the, the benefit of the nation states that they access to public uh, facilities like health, education, infrastructure, and the possibilities for all children, including those from the more poorer communities, mm. uh, to be specifically targeted, if you like, <laughs> focused on to be able to be, to be enabled mm. uh, to reach a level in which our communities, our society of Afri a new African nation will be one which is not only at peace with itself, Mm. But one which, uh, you know, the children who see some British children hanging around in table those days, maybe in 1950, will say, now we've also arrived. Mm. That unfortunately, fast forward, you know, <laughs> to date, I, I don't know how much of that happened. You know, we had uh, 
an early part of our independence uh, that um, um, saw a massive uh, growth in, uh, in, uh, in industry, massive growth in, uh, in opportunities for education, massive growth in, in health facilities, uh, massive enabling in terms of economic enabling through a cooperative movement in, in terms of agricultural sector, targeted uh, investment in girl child education in terms of its schools and others, um, um, fast tracking of, 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 of education and em employment, particularly in the civil service, although that time it was not formally gender mainstreamed mm -hmm. uh, for, for women, then in civil service, of course, there are very few. Uh, and um, that was interrupted by, I mean, there was an attempt of that in the body too. Museveni came in and uh, Sarah has interesting statistics. I think I'll leave it for her the way mm -hmm. she frames it mm -hmm. <laughs> somewhere else in terms of the duration of how long, you know, the percentages of time, you know, which leaders have occupied this country. I think I still want to leave that for her. Mm. Uh, and then when you look at that, Museveni has taken the bulk of this. Mm. You know, and when Museveni has taken the bulk of this, and then you go around the country from Gulu to Tungamo to Tororo to, uh, to Bolisa, you mm. ask yourself, what really are the new things that Mr. Museveni has planted in there mm. uh, for the people of this country? And what real independence have we attained as of today, mm. uh, uh, maybe the 13th, 14th, 13th of, of, of October mm. uh, 2023. Then you realize that no, um, the independence so-called uh, seems to be a privilege of uh, no less than 1% of the population. Mm. The independence seems to be an absent reality in Karamoja, an absent reality in Mosacholi, certainly an absent reality in Maina Gongera. Mm. And that independence is one in which um, if you ask a young boy or a young girl from Kamocha, mm. you know, the, the experience of them seeing their leaders and seeing the police that are supposed to mm. protect them coming to weep, including their leaders, then I'm not quite sure but, but, whether it's general independence. Mr. Shino, what yeah. about, um, you know, the, the argument that um, while Uganda is a work in progress, there has been considerable infrastructure improvement. I'm sure when you're going to Kidgum, it was stomached way up to the border. Um, we have seen a GDP increase up to about 30 something billion currently. But what do you make? At least, don't you think there's some progress like 48, towards that? To around 48, 50 40, billion yes, US dollars. 48 billion dollars compared to maybe, I, I think it was around four or three billion dollars in 86. Don't you think there's a movement or some progress? Mm -hmm. What has the GDP done to the reality of the Karamojong children, the streets of Kampala? There are no street, Karamoja street children here when Museven came to farm. Mm. I was in Kampala. I know for you, you are still not yet around. Mm. You know? So, <laughs> why? No, no, no. Uh, and so, what progress is You talk about the, 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 Kar uh, the, the Kitgum Road. By the way, the Kitgum Road was, is, is 34, 35 years late. Mm. Kitgum Road was supposed to have been done in 1989 under UPC program. It wasn't mm. done. The Gonga Road was supposed to be. Tamaked. It wasn't done. Now, Gonga Road still hasn't been done. Mm. Did you know that Bulisa Road <laughs> was supposed to be done as part of the big national program in 1989? It wasn't done. The last time I was in, 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 in Kagadi, the then area MP, former minister, told me that, well, at least ours, the road was done <laughs> about <laughs> eight years ago, unlike mm. yours in, 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 in Tororo. Mm. But uh, it was simply done because <laughs> of the oil. Mm. You know? <laughs> so, so I don't know. And then the other thing is, you can't do a road going to Bolisa, you mm -hmm. know, and you kill the road in, in Nigeria. You know, you can't do a road in, uh, you know, going to, to going to Tungamo. Done. All roads should be done, you know. You can't do roads uh, to, to, to Tungamo, you know, and you kill the railways, and you kill the airlines, and, and, and you know, and, 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 and you kill uh, water, water transportation, you, and you kill our cooperative movement, and you kill the cooperative bank, and you kill Uganda Commercial Bank. So I don't know what progress we are talking about. Mm. If you talk about GDP, GDP in the sense that what? The, the guys who are net owners are who? Are the pinnates of this world and the standing banks of this world? You know, and the, the MTNs of this world and the Airtels of this world? Where is UTL in, in this? And really, really, who owns UTL? Mm. Those are the GDP things. Who owns Toro Cement? You know, yes. who owns... Uh, who owns and, and who's in charge mm. of the oil extraction industry in, in, in Bulisa? Independence yet, what, yeah, indeed, what did our engineers do? Where are our engineers? How many of them are in charge? Those are the questions that we need to yeah, be asked. Thank you very much. And you introduced, of course, um, an interesting dynamic that what are some of the metrics um, in terms of the impact side of things? What are some of the metrics that uh, maybe we should be looking into when we are discussing progress? Because GDP seems to work very well for, for the regime. 
but uh, in terms of impact, we could be looking at some different metrics. But and, even, and even that, that sometimes is, is very simplistically misleading, mm -hmm. because sometimes they'll talk about that the economy expanded by, 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 by over 10%, as I said, and so is the population, arguably, and say, oh, we now have a big population, that's why we cannot afford to educate our youngsters. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the, the population may have expanded by, uh, by, by, by five, five times, mm -hmm. but as I said, when the population was, say, 8 million, you know, we managed to build the equivalent of 22, 23 hospitals, which today's per capita would be about 140. How mm -hmm. many has NRA built beyond the Peneti and the Boa? Yeah. You know, so, so yeah. if you do those kind of projections, we opened yeah. up schools in every sub, 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 sub district at the time. If GDP has expanded, what has the GDP done? In in the, in in, in and, and the, such as uh, yeah. you know on the you know you, using those kind of figures or the money. So, in whose hands are the po in whose hands in whose pockets? Yes. You know? Th thank you very much. Uh, of course, the the Pinetti Hospital is not yet built, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to uh, bring you in, Dr. Birete. Uh, the president spoke of eight key points for the success. Uh, it's interesting because at first we had ten, four, and for the first time in Kidgu, uh, we had of eight, and <laughs> the essential ingredients ingredients of success for Uganda, uh, placing emphasis on politics of interest rather than identity. One. Two, emancipating the private sector for wealth creation. Three, economic infrastructure, roads, railways, ICT, backbone, and airports. Four, social infrastructure, schools and hospitals. Five, working on regional economic and political integration. Six, international contacts with reliable partners. Seven, eliminate corruption. Eight, protect the environment. What do you make of this? You know, if, if these uh, eight essential points by President Museven were made by a new president, mm. somebody just assuming power in the mm. first year, mm. it will be exciting. Mm. Mm. Just starting from, I, I will leave point number one on the politics of identity to, to Professor Andelisa, yes. he's here with us, mm. I, I want to bother with that, he will mm. do justice to it. But look at point number eight, environment. Mm. We've lost more than 60% of forest cover under the leadership of President Seven in the 37 years. Mm -hmm. We've lost more than 80% of wetland cover under his leadership and watch. What environment is he going mm -hmm. to protect? Mm -hmm. The one we've already lost? I think that is really laughable. Go to the next point of, mm -hmm. of, of, of corruption, mm -hmm. fighting corruption. 37 years, <laughs> Museven mobilizes his hold on to power around corruption. Corruption is an, enab an enabler for mm. his wrong effort in power. Mm. Mm. That's why he cannot discipline anybody, including his ministers, even when there is hard evidence mm. of grabbing Karamoja and sheets. That's why he's incapable mm. of even a cabinet reshuffle after that barbaric saga of, of Karamoja and sheets. Mm. He cannot fight corruption. When you look at the railways, he inherited the country with a functional railway system. Right now, if you trace the rails, you will see gro beans growing there, nakati, all sorts of vegetables, and maybe forests mm. in some places. The rails no longer exist. Mm. 15 years ago, he, he, he laid the foundation for the standard gauge railway mm. in Munyonyo. With the, his counterparts Was it in Kenya years ago? and Tanzania, yes, mm. with his counterparts in Kenya and Tanzania, mm. Kenya has a functional standard railway system. Tanzania has the same. It welcomes you out of Dar es Salaam Airport. Mm. Uganda has not mm. even dug a foundation, and we claim that because there is nowhere to connect on the borders with the Mombasa and whatever. <coughs> therefore, we cannot have even a railway for Ugandan people. Yes, I can understand challenges with connecting with the East African area, but how about the railway mm. as a means of transport for the Ugandan people? Mm. When President Seven came to power, regional airports, the one nearer to me in Imbarara, they were functional. It mm. was mm. functional, but now products have been sold, including mm. part of what used to be the airport. I know people have bought those, those plots of land for, for other things. I don't even know whether we can reconstruct Mm -hmm. Nyachara as a regional airport, and, and I know that under the AFCON bid, AFCON 27, we need some of these regional airports, but mm -hmm. they don't exist. At the time of, of, of President Seven coming to power, we had active internal flights. That's mm -hmm. correct, yeah. Yeah, but now where do you land? Where do you land? 
He has just managed to revive Uganda Airlines. But also he found a function, Uganda Airlines, that was then dilapidated under his leadership. So when you look at most of these points, that's why I said that it would have made sense mm, if it was something. year one of a new president, mm. but not year 37, 39 mm. of an old president that is incapable mm. of performing whatever he's yeah. alleging. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doctor. Uh, I'd like to come to you, Professor. Uh, when I was making the introduction... Yeah, but the politics of identity, I left it for you. Yes, uh, you, you'd have to speak on that. When I was introducing... <laughs> you are not saying that's what I I, and, no, 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 no. And, and, I know you will give a and, better explanation. And you're for the fairness, just to not to lose the point if you don't mind, Prof. Mm. Um, I left a particular point for Sarah. Mm. Sarah makes it so, 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 so... Yes, with on, my the, on the economy. These things about... Part, you know, on the economy plus... But one other thing that Sarah talks about uh -huh. is to, to teach us mathematics. Mm -hmm. That of the 61 years of independence, yes. Mr. Museveni has occupied um, 38 the most, in mm -hmm. the most, you know, with uh, amongst the nine presidents. So one who's occupied 61%. Mm -hmm. The 61% is an important figure. <laughs> yes. Young Ugandan mathematics. Uh, yes, as we celebrate 61 years of yes. independence, mm -hmm. President Museveni has occupied 61% mm -hmm. of Uganda's independence oh. time. Wow. Yes. And the rest of the eight mm. presidents have occupied. Was it 24 years? Yeah, 24 years. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yes, coming to you, uh, Professor, I'd, I'd like to leave it uh, uh, general intentionally so you, you take <laughs> us through. But mm. uh, when I was introducing uh, the, the, the second segment, you corrected me when I said a nation and you said it's a country. Why do you think that is still the case? Oh, thank you to ask that question. Actually, it is tied up with the identity mm, mm, politics. Mm. Uh, in the technical sense of the word, Uganda is not yet a nation state. It is a country. Mm. And I have always used the computer metaphor mm. that for a nation state to be functional, you need both the hardware and the software, like in the computer mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. illustration. Mm -hmm. So Uganda is a country, it is a, a hardware. You have a, a country that was actually created by the British out of very many conglomerates of different ethnic groups and communities. And later on, they added other identities like religion and regions. And... Uh, we are an independent country formally, legally, and diplomatically. We are recognized by the UN. Mm. We have international borders recognized. And we have a government and a, a state machinery, the mm. executive, the legislature, the judiciary, the civil service, the security forces, and all that. Mm. But in terms of uh, national identity, mm. which constitutes a nation, we are still lacking. Mm. If you read the Musta report, there was a report produced in 1961, I think, or 62, yeah. Yeah. shared by Musta. The, the, the actual title should be Uganda Relationships Commission Report. Yes. It points out the challenges of forging a national identity then, which was supposed to be addressed. Mm. And apparently, we have not addressed it. I am afraid. And therefore, when we are talking about development and independence, we should also be talking about forging a nation state, a viable nation state that can organize society for all those developments you are talking about. Mm. Let me use an illustration. That is not to say that that is the only one I would have pointed out. Mm. Of a popular narrative. There is a popular narrative you find in the community in Uganda has been around since independence. Mm. In Uganda, they say, Tobakoye, mm. we are tired of you. Mm. So, can you imagine one community being targeted and saying, we are tired of you. Mm. So, we were at independence, we were tired of the British mm. colonialists, the whites. And we got independence, we, they went. Then uh, people were saying, Tobakoye, we are tired of um, Asians. Mm. And then Idi Amin expelled them. And then at some point, people were saying, we are tired of Mengo, because mm. Mengo was uh, asking for a separation from Uganda. Mm. These are fellow citizens, fellow mm. Ugandans. Mm. But one, uh, some other citizens saying, we are tired of you, Tubakoye. Mm. And then at some point, when Idi Amin was in power and also Obote, and they were all from northern Uganda, 
there was that popular narrative to work all the meaning in Northern Ireland. Mm. The Northern question now. Mm. The Buganda question, the European question, the Indian question, now the Northern question. Mm. Now today they are saying to work all the meaning with Stanas. Mm. So the Western question. Mm. Now, if we are going to continue having these questions that were raised by the Musta Commission report and we are not resolving them, mm. then our independence is not yet Uhuru. Is not yet. Mm. Because we are still divided along those lines of Tubakoye. We are tired of you, and you get one region, third of another one. One region, third of another one. And it is captured in these public narratives, and we need to address them. So we, we, we inherited questions at independence. Mm. Questions means there are factors and issues that linger on mm. and wait for an opportunity to explode, and they need to be reduced gradually so that we have a nation state where the software is not malfunctioning. Now, if you look at that trajectory since independence with those questions, I don't know whether the Karamoja question has been resolved. Mm. We still have the Karamoja question. Mm. We still have the Northern question, by the way. It might be latent. You might think it's not there. There is a Northern question. Mm. There is a Buganda question. If you want to know the Northern question, you look at the Bararo question. Mm. The, the, the new Bararo question now. Some people from one region and say, you go back to your home area. There is the Bunyoro question now reflected in the Bafuruchi question that some Ugandans cannot even hold the post of the chairman. That is the Bararo question. Mm. So we have got the North-South question, which is not exploded, but it will explode in the sense of economy. So you find some regions, especially Central and Western, are already in middle income status. But the North and East are not only in a, a, a faraway position, they are to some extent regret, regret, regressing. Regressing, regressing, yeah. regressing. So when you have a country with that question of division in terms of economy. Now, let me come to the, how the challenge is reflected in our governance and state system. Mm. I want to, re to raise rhetoric questions and Ugandans out there listening and my fellow uh, uh, debaters here can uh, look at that. Who trusts the state? Because we have an independent state, but is it trusted? Mm. Who trusts that the state or the government provides uh, services and public goods equally. Equally between tribes, between regions, and between uh, classes. Mm. Who trusts that if you go to a hospital, you will get equal treatment by the state? Mm. Who trusts that if you go to the land's office, you will get equal treatment, that all tribes are given equal treatment, or all social class, economic classes are given equal treatment, that the rich and the poor, if they go to the police mm -hmm. as a state institution, they will receive equal treatment. That different political parties are given equal treatment by the electoral commission, mm -hmm. or by the police. Or, or, or by the media. Or by the media, the yeah. public media. Yeah. So once you find that feeling that there is no equal and fair treatment of Ugandans by the public institution, then you know that we have a problem. There is no trust that parliament, for example, mm. is going to treat citizens equally, that they are not going to give themselves hefty allowances and leave other people who trust that uh, the land's office will treat all Ugandans equally, who trust that the judiciary can be trusted to dispense justice fairly, and equally, you name it, talk about even NEMA, National Environmental Authority, who trusts that NEMA does not go and evict poor people from the wetland and allow rich people. You see huge, huge mansions yeah. in the wetland, but when a, 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 a poor African goes to eke out a living by growing rice in the wetland, he's yeah. just away. Yeah. If the population doesn't feel that it is treated by a public institution, the state that is to say. 
equally between classes, between regions, between religions, then you know that this independence has still question marks on it. Mm -hmm. So the way forward, how would we create a nation? Professor, just um, to, to, to top in there, don't you think the threat is, it would, it would be fair if, fairly, okay, if the people were not trusting the state, but we are at a point where people also don't trust themselves. We, you spoke of public rhetoric. There's also this rhetoric. Ah, when you get a chance, you eat. So even the, in the general public, people have reached a point where they are demoralized to the point of also seeing them. Eat. For example, they would move, remove someone so that they also eat, not because they want to change how the, the office is run. You're just complimenting what I was saying. Yes, that yes. there is no even trust within the general population. Yes, that's right. That the population do not trust each other and become, people have become very individualistic. Mm. If you go to a window market and you ask a trade, a, one of the traders trading a commodity there or second-hand uh, shirts and you ask them, uh, please, uh, do you have this kind of shirts? And he says, I don't have. You ask him, where can I find it? He won't show it to you. Mm. No, he won't. Mm -hmm. He will simply say, either give me money and they can look it for you. Or he will say, <laughs> I don't know where it is. And yet he knows where it is. So mm. we are increasingly losing that trust even with, among the population. Okay, yes. And therefore, that is what, where, what I mean by having the software, software. malfunctioning. Mm. The, the, what makes a, 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 a country, a hardware, a nation state, mm. are those intangible values of society. So when you lose trust, I was talking about trusting the public institutions, mm. but you find that there is much loss of trust even between the uh, citizens that you can trust your child with somebody else. That it has gone even to the family that a, a mother cannot trust a daughter mm. with the, the husband. Mm. You know, that <laughs> loss of trust mm. is actually eating at the, <laughs> uh, at the connections of society. So... Mm. The, the area we realize that we have a problem of malfunctioning nation state mm. and convene a national conference mm. and identify the values uh, that the principles that make a nation state a nation state. And then we call it to order whoever goes against those values. Then we shall continue having this, these questions I, I mentioned earlier on but all these public narratives that tobacco, mm. you can imagine a fellow sister, citizen saying, at least when we are saying we are tired of the colonialists, mm. but you are saying a fellow citizen that I am tired of you, mm. tired of you, and uh, which means that this implies that if we were invaded, God forbid, by another country, it is possible that some Ugandans would celebrate mm. because they are tired of you, and then they would celebrate the other foreign country coming. It has happened before. That is not what happens in, in those countries which are already nation states. You have heard that actually Israel was almost at the point of disintegrating politically. Mm. You know, people were demonstrating and whatever. The moment they were attacked by Hamas, they buried their hatchets. Yes. Even they, the political leadership has come together. Has come together. But uh, and in the USA, when there are was, they are, they, they are always these divisions between the Democrats and the Republicans, but when they are trade towers were attacked, they came together to fight Iraq and Iran mm. uh, and, uh, and Afghanistan. Mm. But Uganda, in any case, we have been invaded before. Let me call it invasion. It was a liberation, though. Mm. When we were invaded by Tanzanians, Uganda supported Tanzania mm. against Idi Amin. Mm. Didn't we? Yes. Yes. Mm. So, such a scenarios reflect that our independence still has a lot to do. Mm. And I was uh, limiting myself to the identity and the political and the national question. But let me quickly talk about the economy. Yes. Who owns Uganda's economy since independence? Mm. Today, when the whites left, by the way, the whites, the British left us with a hand hope. Mm. And the peasants, the majority of people are still hand hope. Diggers. Uganda was a least developed country. Today it is still a least developed country. Mm. In terms of GDP per capita, you talked about GDP. GDP. Mm. Mm. Yes, it has increased because population has increased and production has increased. But in terms of GDP per capita, I don't think we are far mm. apart mm. from where they left us. When you talk about industries, I mean, hose were made here, pangas were made here, <laughs> clothes were made here in Ginger. Chillington Hall, although it was a, a British company, it was here. 
I, I, most of these products were also made here. There was a meat packing factory in, 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 in Soroti. There were textile factories in, in, in Mbari mm. and the Ginger. There was a, a starch making factory in Rila. So you cannot say there was trigger industries uh, uh, here around. So the, the industries were there. But let me put it this way because I can be mis misunderstood. Mm. Have we added on in terms of volume? Mm. Yes, we have. We have in terms of quantity. Mm. I am talking about quality. You may have roads which you are talking about. Yes, we have added on kilometers of roads. Mm. But has transportation improved in Uganda in general? Mm. Do we have railways, as I said? Are they functioning? Are our ports functioning mm. in Uganda? The, the, the port systems? Is the water system uh, actually the, 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 the ferries? There are more ferries must in the port. I don't know which port. Mm. Are they also functioning? Mm. And you can have this Tamaka road going to Guru, but you, what about the Maram roads going to different places? Mm. He talked about Ntungamo, where he come from. Mm. And he says, now there is a Tamaka road from here to Ntungamo, but from Ntungamo to my place, mm. we don't have a tax, by the way. There is mm. no public transport. Border borders can go through. No tax. Because the road is very, very poor. Mm. So when you look at it in totality, in terms of transportation improving qualitatively, mm. qualitatively, you find that one has also not improved. Mm. But much more so, me, I am worried about who owns Uganda's economy. Mm. Mm. All banks in Uganda, mm. let anybody challenge me, they are foreign owned. All banks, yes. even Centenary, 51% mm. shares now are foreign mm. owned. Mm. By who? By foreign, foreigners, foreign, foreign, foreign investors. Huh? Mm. Yes. yes. You go to uh, 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 the oil sector. Mm. The oil sector. Total, I don't know. Shell, which is, has a different name now, although it still uses Shell. All of them, and this is where money is. Mm. Who owns them? Foreign capital, including mm. Kenyan capital around now. You go to telecommunication companies. Mm. MTN, Airtel. Mm. Owned by foreigners. Those are the people, th those are the commanding heights of the economy where actually money is. You go to insurance companies. Mm. Who owns in, in, insurance companies? Who owns these overhauling companies, these companies that take things abroad? Mm. You know, these which uh, transport things abroad. Mm. They are all foreigners. Mm. Go to industries which are said to be booming. Construction. They are owned by, by foreigners. Mm. Construction. Construction industries mm. are owned by foreigners. And I hope the general average people will understand what I'm talking about here. We have got a liberalized capital account. Mm. A liberalized capital account means that the policy in Uganda is that whatever you make in Uganda, you are free to expatriate it. Mm. You can take it outside. So that's why we have GDP growth without being felt mm. in the lives of the people. Mm. Because money invested here, which captures that GDP growth, Mm. goes out again. There is hemorrhage. There is economic hemorrhage still continuing. And then NRM came up with a 10-point program saying mm. they are going to stop economic hemorrhage. Mm. But we have economic hemorrhage today mm. much more than even at independence because these companies mobilize proceeds, mobilize profits here and expatriate them without investing here. Mm. There is no bank here which is investing in Uganda. They just mobilize funds and go out. There is no telecommunication company which is investing in production in agriculture or any other sector here. Mm. It, it, it takes it outside. There is no petrol company that is investing in production here in Uganda other than building their petrol stations. It, 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 it repatriates the money outside. There is no insurance company that is investing in Uganda here. So, are, are we independent? Independent in which sense? Mm. If we are not economically independent, Mm. Professor, um, just before we leave the economic question, uh, of course, we, I spoke to a researcher from the Marcus Gav Institute, and he was telling me one of the metrics to track is the gross asset value per capita, the asset value of Ugandans. And that, that brings up the issue around the land question. Uh, you've spoken foreigners. What about the general rural transformation? Is it throwing more Ugandans into urban poverty or... How, how does it connect with, with the general issue? Of Part of how it connects is that uh, we want somebody with clear statistics. I don't have them here. But in Uganda, 
the gap between the poor and the rich is becoming a gulf and it is increasing. If I may first Much share more this than statistics. Before. She, has, she wants... Yes, she can yes. give us statistics. Uh, the latest report released in September by mm. the African Development Bank mm. on the outlook on the economy in mm. East Africa. Uganda has the highest income inequality mm. at 45.5%. For compulsion purposes, Tanzania is at 40.5%, Burundi is at 40.1%, and Kenya is at 38.9%. So we almost have 50-50 income inequality in Uganda. Mm. 16.36 million Ugandans are living in extreme poverty. That is 36% of the population. And if you look at Uganda's multidimensional poverty profile, the latest released in 2022, Bukhid is at 78%. Mine. Poverty. <laughs> That's where I come from. <laughs> yeah, he's from Bukit. And this is the please, extent. Please of, sympathize with me, sister. This is the extent of deprivation mm. of, of the citizens. And, and it looks at all aspects of, of people's lives, mm. including yeah. formal education, ownership of land, that is child headed families. <laughs> so you, 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 you have. Uh, you have Karamoja at 76%, Bugisu at 72%. Acholi is 69%, Busoga 61%, and West Nile also 76%. It shares yeah. with Karamoja. National statistics for the poverty, the multidimensional poverty. National level, rural, countrywide, we have 55%, urban 23%. So mm. we have an increasing divide between the urban and the rural, rural mm. population mm. Mm. all over. Because the regional breakdown in East. You have the rural multidimensional poverty at 67% average, urban multidimensional poverty at 46%. In mm -hmm. the north, rural is at 68%, urban is at 33%. In mm -hmm. the west, rural is at 43%, urban is at 23%. Central, which has the lowest, rural is at 38%, urban is at 15%. So this shows you how... Mm. And those are statistics for Bubos. Mm. So is, we cannot say yeah. these are statistics that may have been forged by opposition or mm. the other group. That is that. But I wanted to finally, yes, because yes. I can see time mm. may not be there, yes. to comment about one factor of development. I don't know whether the president talked about it here. Mm. There among the eight or nine, mm. the question of labor productivity, mm. the question of education and technology and labor productivity generally. Mm. Statistics, if one could find them also, labor productivity if is in the South African region, we are the poorest. Mm. We are the lowest. In terms of labor productivity, mm. in terms of land productivity, we are also going very down. Re land productivity, not production. Mm. Land productivity. In terms of a, a quality of education, mm. there was a, a statistics by a certain research group. Is it Kwaweze? This is an East African statistics. Mm. It has found out that actually Uganda is now lagging behind Kenya mm. and Tanzania, mm. especially primary education in terms of quality of education. Remember at independence, Uganda was far, far ahead of those sister countries of ours. Mm. Today, we are the ones who are behind. Mm. So we need to reflect upon this independence and see how to move forward. We are not saying that quantitatively, more children have not gone to school. They have. Mm. But, but for, 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 for what quality, what technology, mm. how many what patents is. does Uganda register yes. every year? Patent rights. So that we know that even technologically, we are improving. What about employers in Uganda? Go and ask employers in Uganda. They are always quarreling and complaining mm. about our graduates. Mm. Now, don't throw it at me, at my, <laughs> my <laughs> master. Our graduates. Of one lecturer. <laughs> but our graduates are not employable. <laughs> we, don't ha we have not given them employable skills. Mm. And we are still one years of independence. Mm. Surely, is that a good trajectory? Mm. I am not necessarily saying that I am only pointing out this groom a picture because I want to point it out per se, mm. I am saying that we need to reflect back yeah. and not be just De uh, optimistic extravagantly. Mm. Yeah? That everything is okay, is, is okay, is okay, is okay. It is okay to be optimistic, mm. but not to be so extravagantly optimistic. to the point of missing out, reflecting and say, 
okay, this is independence. We have moved quantitatively at this level, mm. but what about qualitatively? Have we moved? If we have not, what is what can be done? What are the pitfalls and how can we avoid them? Mm. But every time people are given rosy pictures, rosy pictures, everything is okay, and we are moving forward, and everything is going ahead. Mm. Now we are talking about the export of minerals. Huh? Mm. No, not export of minerals, but adding value to them here. Mm. The president, I, I, and I like him for that policy. Except that as we talk about that, we are constructing a, 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 a what is that? That one to take our oil outside. Pipeline. A pipeline. A pipeline. We are constructing a pipeline to take our raw materials Ooh. out. Mm. When we are saying addition. it should be value addition. Mm. Because there is even, I think, an executive order not to export mm. goods a, that have yeah, no any value addition. Minerals, yes. So, yeah, yeah, but, but only so is what mineral. is the pipeline mm. for? What is the pipeline for? for? I think it's they, they, were, they were speaking in the light of extractives. Extractive minerals. Uh, but you cannot see. You have double standards. <laughs> but even the uh, oil is <laughs> extractive. Right, yeah, I'd, yeah. like to, I'd like to. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Bambusha. Contradictions. Um, um, yeah. Mr. Sheno, um, if Paula, which was, uh, you're sitting on his seat, if he was here, I'd, I'm sure uh, one of the achievements that uh, they are really proud of is, is this, the prevalent state of peace, or the, at least the appearance of it, uh, which, you know, Ugandans live in peace, you can go to the shop, you can go to the bar, you can travel all over the country, uh, to the extent that we also have ex projected this peace to our Pan-African endeavors, you know, in Somalia and other places. What do you make of our... I would even add on that Uganda is not a failed state in yes. that regard. Yes. What, what, what do you make of that complement to, 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 to Uganda thus far? I would reject it, and I reject it on behalf of Mr. Witch. Mm. Um, I was born and grew up in Uganda without NRA. One of the reasons why I'm very, very strongly confident that NRA is a, is, 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 is a net disaster to this country is mm. that uh, I saw all the governments before and I uh, have seen NRA and in comparative terms, uh, minus it, aspects of Idi Amin, NRA is actually terribly the worst. Talk peace, I don't think you'll tell peace to the people of Kitgum except that today they have the peace. There's no peace. There's no justification. You think it's peace or it's order? Well, I was going to say that. You know, there's no <laughs> that does not justify, justify the existence in mm. concentration camps. Mm. And then to talk about peace, uh, uh, to justify the fact that they're going to bed without food mm. you know, in their mouth. To talk about peace, and I don't know whether there's peace in Karamoja. To mm. talk about peace, and then there's street children, um, uh, some of them were mothers at 12 in the streets of Kampala, and to talk about peace, when actually I traveled to, 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 to Katuna, from mm. Kabul to Katuna, mm. and before NRA, and, uh, and, and, and assessed genuine peace. But even then, NRA was in the bush anyway. Mm. So, so no, uh, uh, there is nothing special. <laughs> mm. And this peace thing is a, is a tricky one, particularly for you young people. NRA blackmails Ugandans that they ushered in peace. As if peace is uh, something that needs to be negotiated out of the state. It's not. It's, it's a basic fundamental right that is responsible the state to be able to provide that. Mm -hmm. And for a, 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 a regime that bombed itself into power mm -hmm. and has stuck around for the last 38 years, if at least the very bare minimum they cannot provide peace, what else they can they? They can't provide us with the health, the guaranteed health, free health service. They're not. They can't provide us with free education. They're not. Um, this week, in fact, in the last three, five days, talk about independence. Within the last five days, I have had requests, including this afternoon as I was uh, uh, preparing to come to the studios and preparing to finish a, a consultant's report for, 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 for somebody, uh, where um, a, a young Ugandan graduate from a very eminent Ugandan family mm. uh, was approaching me for a job. You know, and this is someone who graduated two years ago with a first class honors degree. Uh, part of what uh, uh, Professor here has talked about, they can't. I don't know what that piece is. So if this piece about going to bed and, 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 and sleeping around cockroaches, mm -hmm. then uh, I, 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 I would rather uh, be, be slightly uh, a freer person in a particularly different way. Mm -hmm. So, no, the, the piece thing about NRA is a blackmail uh, uh, scheme that, uh, you know, uh, civic space cannot uh, help them to, 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 to continue with. Uh, because, as I said, for the 38 years, 
of NRA, you know, um, this piece is, you can talk about peace in the last five years and peace. You can't ask the people of Kasese you know, about this piece. This piece, you cannot ask the people of Kayunga. This piece, you cannot talk, talk with the people of Kamocha. You can't talk about this piece. This piece, you can't talk about, you to, 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 can't talk about Robert Chagulani, mm. this piece. So, no, um, uh, I, would, I would rate NRA on this peace thing on zero because there's nothing specific about this peace thing no, that I NRA has provided. Say zero. It is not a failed state. We don't have a failed state. In Uganda, no, but zero does, in Congo, but but zero. But does, the question is, it sustainable? Maybe but, that is what you would raise. No, but but I will see still to it because it, it does not have to necessarily be a, a, a failed state. Because again, that's part of the thing. And the NRA guys normally, when they they, they, they invoke Somalia and they invoke Libya, you say that well, including on the when the, if you change government, you know you know they're being pushed to change government. If you change, see what happens. No government change in Kenya, and life continues. Governments change in Zambia. And life continues. Governments change in South Africa, and life continues. Government change in 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 in, uh, in uh, even the Gambia these days. Governments change in, in Ghana, and and life continues. So so no, uh, uh, that, that, that does not necessarily apply. But that said, I uh, I also struggle with one thing that I don't know after thirty eight years any single justification for Mr. Museveni to continue in power. I don't. See. Mm -hmm. There's not a single justification. For why Mr. Museveni should continue in power, mm. except as I said, that peace thing, and that's why I'm continuing to insist on it. Mm. <laughs> that uh, oh, if there is change, there will be instability. The blackmail thing that you know, NRA says that well, if you if 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 you push us away, we shall make it ungovernable. For you. Like the way they try to make Obote two government ungovernable, mm. but you know, gladly Ugandans rejected them up to including Masaka. Gladly, Uganda rejected them, including Bomba, they were confined in Luero. But very unfortunately for Ugandans, because of the, there were a war of terror, like what others would say in what's happened in the Middle East, they would send little kids, little boys to come and throw bombs in Kampala and people would run. Mm. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, finally, Dr. Biret, before we go to concluding, uh, concluding remarks, could you speak to independence in the light of especially um, a burgeoning population of youth? Uh, we have one of the youngest population in the world, and uh, in the light of transition. Basically, our colleagues have managed to bring it from the past, but what about looking into the future, into the next two generations? What kind of Uganda are we looking at, given the circumstance? Yeah, I, I will build it from the previous point of peace. Mm. I think Uganda has absence of war. Although we have a bit of skirmishes here and there, ADF attacks, Mm. state attacking Kasese and, and, and other, mm. other things of, of conflict. And the yeah, and, and of course Chifesi and, and other things. Mm. But but I think we largely have absence of war. Uh, and Not uh, peace. Yes. Mm. Because why do I say so? Look at the poverty levels. Mm. How many people sleep hungry? Mm. How many people... The, uh, uh, well, uh, there was a report by... What, what, what's the institution on people mm. failing to have one meal a day? Mm. People having one meal a day. Mm. Children starvation numbers and malnutrition. Look at the loss of jobs from mm. COVID. Loss of businesses. Properties of people advertised for sale on a daily basis. Mm. Well, the Bank of Uganda has warned that the default on loans mm, is likely mm. to increase above 40 percent mm. just this week if you look at big businesses like i have in and others you know being threatened with failure to service their loans mm. bitter look at bitter you know the mm. list is endless well, what you are saying is summarized by the nobel prize winner amatya said in freedom from what yes in his book yes development as freedom yes so, yes, so we don't have that social harmony. Mm. If you call it social harmony, people are able, people are unable mm. to meet their basic needs in life. Yes. We, you can even refer to the increasing street children on Kampala mm. Street. So we don't have that stability of mm. basic needs. Mm. If you go to school going children, a lot of people are afraid to return their children. Third term, mm. to return their children's school. We, we, we need to look at P7 figures, people who have failed, mm. that would have sat PLA, that cannot.
people who should have been sitting senior for exams starting next week that cannot because of poverty mm. and that government cannot cushion them because education is a basic need that equalizer mm. for everybody regardless of what of your social background mm. you know government can't even issue an order that it is third term don't stop candidates mm. For, mm. from coming to school you can withhold results later but mm. let them see it mm. 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 even that has not happened mm. so you so you have these challenges look at people failing to access medical mm. care mm. basic medical care dying of preventable diseases 61 years of independence we cannot even afford we talk of you know structures health a health center abc whatever but what is in these centers if you don't have money are you able to be serviced mm. i don't know any health center in bishen where my relatives can go without money and get a service mm. i don't mm. so where are they where are they we pay for every service So if you have created a center 2 3 4 5 where are these centers that do not serve the people? Mm. If you go to Mlago how many how many of the services are free by the way? Because I know one of my relatives went to the women mm. women women hospital in Mlago but we had to pay. We yeah, had the men in Mlago you still pay most of the technology services whatever checking you pay. So why is it a government hospital? What is the meaning of a government hospital? Mm. So these are the things we must you know critique reflect on reflect on what is the meaning of a government hospital is it just a structure mm. and why do we spend taxpayers money mm. in that hospital also to make the same taxpayers double pay for the services when they when mm. they are in need mm. so once you don't have the questions you answers to these questions then the issue of peace mm. without social harmony amongst the population does not exist i can also look at the issue of constitutional stability mm. it does not exist on the eve of independence the constitution meant 28 years when the, you looked at the, the spirit you know the framers of the of the 1995 constitution mm. they had a spirit of never again mm. never again mm. shall we have a president failing to retire never again shall we have abuse of human rights never again shall we have brutality never again shall we have failure of checks and balances but to those, to those who are alive they've had it their words mm. because all these things have happened mm. the constitution has been overrun by an overbearing president and, and to be fair on that i am normally very critical about the 1995 constitution which i call enery constitution but you know sir most of the uh framers of the constitution mm. alive when you meet them individually these guys were extremely genuinely in ceremonial state yeah. that they were revolutionary they they, trying you know, to create you know a yes. sort of watershed moment mm. so the way so yes. huge amount of hope that was with dashed mm. yes. yes yeah we can also refer to the to the words of the that James Wapakabulo mm. when he was mm. sharing mm. The, the the constitution of making lessons mm. In, in, with Kenya mm. he said unless Ugandans disrupt themselves this constitution should be able to take us to mm. a modern state mm. a modern and evolved state mm. so the question we need to ask then is over the 28 years did we choose to disrupt ourselves mm. or who disrupted who Ugandans <laughs> I, i want to point out quickly i know that we've run out of time the mm. the three key amendments two of which have disabled the constitution mm. the first key amendment to the constitution was through a referendum of course which ushered in greater political freedoms mm. through a return to multi-party politics positive mm. Mm. the second key amendment was the removal of term limits mm. very negative and destructive to this country and whoever participated in the removal of term limits mm. to the constitution should get to a public podium and apologize to Ugandans for disrupting their progress. Mm. The third key amendment, very destructive was the removal of age limit which happened at gun point with the invasion of parliament, soldiers in the chambers brutalizing MPs. Mm. Shameful. So in the end, the piece you're talking about, the generational the demographic dividends. Yes, we have the you have the numbers. 78% of Ugandans are young people. But do they understand their power? 
in the last two consecutive elections, youth have been majority. In 2016, mm. youth were above 8 million voters. In the last elections, they were above 11 million voters. Mm. But what do you have to show for it mm. when you cannot restrict this country mm. with your numbers? Mm. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, and I would start with you, Dr. Biret, on, on parting remarks. Just in, um, no, I think I've concluded. Okay. <laughs> Since right. I took more um, time. I'll, I'll let um, <laughs> Mr. Shen and then our dear guest. No, I'll, yeah. I, I'll just say that, look, um, I'll conclude with the question of peace, but versus uh, the biggest thing for the youth, Sarah, mm. is this thing of fear. Peace versus fear. Mm. The vast majority of young people uh, feel, and as you know, I engage them substantially, and it's basically part of my focus in, in terms of enabling young people going forward beyond ourselves. And many of them will talk permanently about fear, fear, fear. Young people who fear just literally getting associate, openly associating with you. P young people fearing to engage in the political process, mm. you, know, you know, meaning joining active political parties. Young people who simply don't uh, feel comfortable you know, having open conversations like this because it's political. And, and these are young people who are of age, relatively educated, relatively exposed. And in many cases, like Sarah was saying, feeling extremely strongly uh, against what they see is uh, a, a nation, their nation, going in a negative direction, but some of them seeking to invoke God. Like there's something doing the round saying that uh, the Israelis uh, uh, use rockets, you know, <laughs> To, to fight for their freedom, while for us Africans, Ugandans, we are praying to the Israeli God to rescue us. So many young people are seeking to follow many of our elder retired generation who are saying now, we now give it to God, we're giving up, waiting for fate mm -hmm. uh, to be able to deal with. I think it's a very difficult and very terrible situation uh, uh, because it's actually a very dangerous situation uh, which threatens um, what you anybody else can think is peace because it's a threat to stability. In the event that we reach a stage in which the majority of our citizens, who are basically young people, feel they don't have a clear mandate to be able to cause change or to impact on their day-to-day -day livelihoods, the risks are they go into the extremes. And the extremes in the absence of war means basically we are, we are wrapping up young people in a pot of organized boil that only tomorrow should it explode it explodes into a state in which I'm not quite sure our founding parents and independent sought. And that is the threat. That's the reality. And I think the reality that uh, Mr. Museven today at 61 uh, mm -hmm. ought to be able to be reflecting on. And many people associated with him, many people supporting him, and particularly also many people who are following him blindly. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shen. And of course, for all the discourse that uh, we have had today. And finally, uh, Professor, as we conclude, as we conclude and uh, looking at uh, where we should go in the few decades of independence after these 60 decades, I think that we needed to transit from individual rule to institutional rule, mm. fundamentally. Two, we need to shift from militarism or uh, militarism as a norm of political rule to civil political culture. Mm civil political culture okay. mm. from militarism mm. because even the population seems to support militarism. But unless we shift from militarism to civil political culture, we shall still continue having a malfunctioning software, mm. computer. Mm. And three, we have to find a way of improving the quality of education in this country because we are living in the knowledge age. Mm. And we cannot afford to have poor quality education behind Tanzania and Kenya, for which we are ahead. We need to have quality education, and the quality education will bring about economic transformation. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. It was uh, such an honor, of, uh, an honor, of course, uh, having you here today. And uh, of course, to all my panelists, uh, thanks for the discourse and deliberations that we have had. And to our dear viewers, um, it has been rich. Uh, I hope you've learned a lot. Personally, I've learned so much. And my take, of course, is that uh, we should not celebrate independence just yes, in terms of numbers. Uh, next year, it will be 62. One day, it will be 75. But, <laughs> quality. but in terms of the quality, in fact, we should be celebrating achievements, even if it's not Independence Day. That's correct. Yeah. So thank you very much for sticking with us here on uh, Civic Space 
uh, TV. Uh, of course, uh, make sure you share and comment and keep the discussion going. As I always say, we are, we are all uh, aiming at a, collectively at a Uganda that works for every one of us. Thank you. Mm -hmm.